fighting the Chinese and the North Koreans. Then the ceasefire was signed on July 27th of 53. We stopped killing one another, and we helped the South Korean people rebuild their country into the great economic powerhouse that it is today, because of the peace they've had for the last 65 years. When I came home, I served in the Army Reserve where I served during the Cold War, and I served during the Vietnam War. My wife said to me, look, you're all in one piece. Why don't you retire? Three wars are enough. And I agree with her. Of course, there is no other thing I can do about it. But the wife, you'll have to do what she says. Now, if you have any questions <coughs> at all, stand up. Let's hear whatever it is that you have to say. I'm commander of the Chapter 54 of the Korean War and Korean Defense Veterans of America. The difference is that those of us who fought in the war are called Korean War Veterans. Now, as you know, or you should know, there has never been a peace treaty signed between North Korea and the United States. So that war on paper has gone on for quite a while now, it's quite into the what, 65th anniversary, I believe, I forget, the numbers go beyond me. <coughs> but <clears throat> that is what we're faced with. We had young men and young women serve in Korea well over 60 years. They're called Korean defense veterans. The blue jackets that you see represent the fact that we fought under the United Nations. Although we had, America had the most troops, we were part of the United Nations. That's the colors. Any questions at all on that? 37 months of constant combat. 37,000 young men were killed in action. 105,000 were wounded, carry those wounds to today. 7,500 were captured. God help you if you were captured by the North Koreans, they shot you on the spot. Chinese, of course, usually for propaganda purposes. Of well, that 7,500, roughly 3,500 came back. The rest are somewhere in North Korea, in Russia, and in China. We don't know where they are. 8,000 were MIA, missing in action. Those are the ones we cry about at night. They were never brought home to be buried in their homeland. We don't know where they are. We had hoped that if negotiations went a little better with North Korea, we could get some of those young men bring their bodies back home where they belong. But we have to leave that up to the politicians now and hope that everything will square away. That's the story of Korea. How'd you get in the military? I joined the Navy in June 1950 at 17 years of age. I volunteered. When did you get the Korea? In the Korea, 1951. I was drafted three months shy of 17 years old in 1958. When did you get there? 
1959 and come home in 1960. Right, he got there after, therefore he's a Korean defense veteran. I enlisted through ROTC and arrived in Korea in 1974. Defense veteran. Now, funny part was I never wanted to be a soldier. I was a happy civilian. Graduated from Woodbury High School in 48. Yes, I know there were dinosaurs back then. <laughs> but it was, <laughs> at that point in our life, nobody in the normal life could go to college because we didn't have the finances. But I did get to a business school where I learned a little bit about accounting and learned how to work in an office. I got a job with a CPA working at that time when I was 19 years old. And I was looking forward to a great, wonderful life. The best part was I had met a young, beautiful redhead. And my life was set. One day I got a letter that said, Greetings from the President of the United States. You are here by order for induction in the United States military. You will appear at a certain time and certain place. And our generation didn't question it. My father fought in the Second World War. My uncle fought in the First World War. So it didn't mean anything to me. I knew I had to go. And off I went. I'd leave my job. I had to leave my first automobile. I had to leave that beautiful redhead. And I had to leave my whole life. Stopped. And a new world opened up under me, which is called the military. And I went into the military and not knowing exactly what was ahead of me. But you will learn. You will adapt. You must adapt. You'll learn discipline. And you'll learn the skills to keep you alive when that problem faces you. Fortunately, as a private, I was sent to OCS, Officer Candidate School. I spent a little less than six months in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, became an artillery. Lord observe, it was my job when they sent me to Korea to get on the highest mountain that we could get, bridge, and direct artillery fire onto the enemy. Now, most classes, somebody asks you, did you kill anybody? Unfortunately, I did, by the hundreds. But that was my job. That's what I was supposed to do as an artillery Keep the infantry, the enemy infantry, off of our infantry. I can't believe it's been that long ago. I can still remember. I can remember the shouts. I can remember the screams. I can remember the times that we went without food and water. And I can remember the cold, 20 degrees below zero. And I remember the 105 degrees in the summer. And I remember the monsoons when it used to rain and you get two feet of water. And lived in that. Lived in a hole in the ground called a foxhole. That was part of being a soldier. When I came out, finally, and got back into civilian life, I took the GI Bill. The most wonderful thing the government ever did for its young people. Our generation couldn't get to college, but I did. And I got to college at Rutgers University, graduated in 1958, went to Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, Wharton, where I got my master's degree in accounting and in economics. I worked for 50 years as a corporate executive. This little guy from Woodbury who couldn't afford to go to college. 50 years. I had a good life. Of course, and I married that redhead, by the way. And we've been married for 62 years. So that shows girls marry a soldier. That is the story of one person who had saw his duty as he saw fit and in the way in which he believed in America and his freedom. Freedom is not free. Do you have any questions? No questions? Come on. All right. At least I told you. Yeah, please. Now, uh, these ears are called artillery ears. 
So what inspired you to get into economics and study that? Ah, a little business school called Camden Commercial. It's all gone now. But I knew that from my own experience as a young man, I knew that I wasn't that good mechanically, so I knew I couldn't get into mechanics. I knew that I had some kind of a inclination for mathematics that helped. That helps a lot. Of course, today you've got computers that do what we had to do with it in our head. But I realized that. And then going to business school, I realized that this isn't too bad. Then working for a CPA, I realized the potential. But you've got to love what it is that you're doing. You just don't go to work to make a paycheck. You have got to like your work. You've got to understand it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You want to be an accountant? Uh, maybe. Think about it, man. That's a good job. I worked 50 years and never was out of work. Okay. Anything else? Yes. How are you able to cope with all the losses? Loud, son. I can't read. Oh. How are you able to cope with all the losses in the war? You don't. All you can do is do your job. You've been trained for what to do, although they can never get you trained for, for combat. You don't know. The first thing you do is get scared. And if you don't get scared, there's something wrong with you because you realize that your life is on the line. Uh, you do what you're told. You follow your instructors. You follow your commanders. You, you be prepared. For the inevitable, Sergeant told me, says, Lieutenant, don't worry about dying because you've got nothing to do with it. Fate will take care of that. Just do your job. And that's how you do it. You just let it go. There is residual, yes. Yeah, there was. I had a problem for about five years, but I finally got over that. Uh, and every once in a while now, you get a little bit of a flashback. Uh, these are, you know, it's difficult for me to explain to you on people. You, one day you're, you're talking to this guy that you know you went through basic training with or you went to OCS with. And the next day, where is he? He's dead. He was 21 years old. But he had his whole life ahead of him, but he's gone. Price of victory, my friends, price of freedom is high. Okay, anything else? Good questions. Yes, ma'am. How did you guys stay entertained during your time in Korea? Ah. <laughs> About entertainment in Korea. Did you have anybody? Yeah, I had a couple of young girls come in every month. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute now. <laughs> Whoa. Turn that camera on. <laughs> no, I, that's what you dreamed about. <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to say, and I hope you know, young people never do it, but I did a lot of drinking over here. Uh -uh. Yeah. Tell them how you, you come out of that now. Well, part of my history, I started drinking when I was 12 years old. I stopped when I was 40, and I've been sober for over 40 years. Shows or anything. Nothing in the back of me. I'm not going to tell you about mine. <laughs> I've got to let these people talk. If there's enough time to end here, maybe we'll go over that. Okay. My other combat veteran, tell them all about your little trial that you had. <laughs> all right, good morning, guys. Is this a freshman class? No. no, no. I'm sorry about that. A junior? Yeah, junior? Yeah, yes. Yeah, good. Yeah. You're ready to go out in the world, right? You're going okay. to need an escort out of this building, you know, after that first question. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Carl, and good morning, guys. I, I enlisted in the United States Navy <clears throat> at 17 years of age. In June of 1950, the Korean War broke out in June of 1950. I was in boot camp, and the Korean War broke out. Now, when you join the service, you got to be trained. In the Army, they call it basic training. In the Navy and Marine Corps, they call it boot camp, 
Why do you call it boot camp? Because you get booted around for three months. You learn how to live with one another. They make men out of boys. You'll eat food you never ate before. You'll do things you never thought of doing. When you come out of boot camp or basic training, you're a different person. You probably got muscles you never had before. Now, in the Navy, they don't teach you how to kill. Our job is to run a ship. I never shot a military weapon while I was in the Navy. The only persons that carry weapons or shoot weapons are the gunners mate. In the Navy, all different rates. You got boats and they radar, you got cooks, you got medics. Everybody's got a different job on a ship. <clears throat> the only people that shoot the firearms are called gunners mates, and you're trained for that. Other than that, I never handle a weapon. Okay? Now, they give you a test when you go in the service. That tells them what you're good at. And I was qualified to go to Corbin School, Advanced Medical School, okay? You know, for three months. When I came out, I got assigned to U USS Midway, one of the biggest carriers in the United States Navy. Over 4,000 sailors. We had 100 planes. Uh, we had 50 corpsmen, three doctors, two surgeons. And on a ship, you don't have nurses. So who took care of the six sailors were the corpsmen. And I got tired of taking care of the six sailors. The only way to get off the ship, I had a volunteer for the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps does not have medics. The Navy supplies the Marines with first aid men, nurses, and doctors, because the Marine Corps is part of the Navy. Okay? I put a transfer in, and about two weeks later, Zingo. I'm in Camp Pendleton, New Jersey, New Jersey, Camp Pendleton, California. Now, when I got there, they hand me a shovel, a gun, and a first aid kit. Now, on a ship, I had three hot meals a day, a nice bunk to sleep in, I had entertainment, movies every night. I said, boy, did I make a mistake? The first thing I did is tell us how to dig a foxhole. We had to live like the Marines did. I had to learn how to shoot all the Marine weapons. And I had to learn all about battlefield wounds, which we never did before in, in Corbin School. I was there about three months. Three months, I was there, they sent us to Korea. We landed, no, I went to Japan first for three, four days, and then we went on a ship, and we landed in Pusan, okay? Now, my job in Korea, was not to kill. My job in Korea was to save lives, but I had a weapon, I had the means to kill, and I would kill if I had to, all right? I, I don't want to talk about battlefield wounds because you won't eat your lunch today. Uh, it's horrible. You see legs get blown off and arms and bodies cut. I don't even want to talk about that. The, uh, in Europe, the first said they wore a red cross on their helmet and red cross on their arm. Well, the Far East, if you wore a Red Cross, this is where you got shot. They made a nice target. So we were not identified. All the men knew who we were. We carried our first aid packs. And uh, our job was, again, to save lives, not to take lives. We also treated the enemy. The enemy soldier got shot, uh, and we had a time to take care of him. We did, but he came last. Our wounded usually got shot in the head. It wasn't unusual to find a Marine with his hands tied behind his back with a bullet in his head. It's very cruel, very cruel people. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. This is an American bayonet. And this was taken off a dead Chinese soldier. All the weapons we used were World War II. The Chinese, Russians' weapons were all from World War II. This is a North Korean Chinese weapon. This is our Weapon. What would you rather get stabbed with? You're gonna get stabbed. Anybody can tell me? Come Neither on, guys. Neither huh? one. Neither right. one yeah. You ready to get stabbed with this one? I Why? Skinnier. Huh? Skinnier. No, you ready to get stabbed with this one? Huh? This makes a wound where you can sew it. When you get stabbed, this is triangle. You can't sew this wound. It makes a bigger hole, and you'll bleed more. All right. This is what they use for being able to use. This could be. Cured. We can sew this up. You can't sew this up. You probably bleed it up. There is a difference between two weapons, the North Koreans and our weapons. Just gives you an example. All right. Uh, we all have stories to tell, and sometimes you'll never forget it. Well, I got one good story, and uh, I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, 
in, in, in Korea, we had mountains and rice paddies, and the Chinese had one mountain in front of them, and, and you had another mountain behind them, and we were fighting to take one mountain, and they would take it back, and we would take it back, and so forth. When I landed in Korea, in Pusan, they put us in little trains, they took us to a staging area, I got in the truck, I went to the front lines, and the ring uh, compounds, about maybe three, four hundred Marines. As soon as I got there, I looked around, I see body bags laid there, Marines walking around, all bandaged stuff. I said to the sergeant, what happened? He says, three hours before you got here, we got shelled by the Chinese. About three miles in front of the camp was a, was a hill. The Chinese had occupied a hill, and occasionally they would shell the Marines, and then they would shell them back and so forth. That's what Korea was. Uh, it was all. Uh, the people of Korea were great to us. You couldn't eat the food, though, because they use human uh, sewage for, for fertilizer. Uh, we call it the honey cart. Uh, all the village would go in one place, and the farmer would come, shovel on, on the cart, and go in the fields and, and use it as fertilizer. So we weren't allowed to eat the fruit or to drink the water or anything like that. Uh, it, it was, uh, you see some nice apples you wanted to eat, but you know, if you ate, you might get sick. The story I want to tell is I was on night duty with the ready man and the lieutenant. I was in a bunker. Anybody know what a bunker is? Yeah. All right. In front of the bunker, the Marines put barbed wire. They put tin cans. They put empty shells. So if you hit the wire, the, the shells would rattle and it would alert you that someone's trying to come through the wire. Okay. We were told that night that the enemy might try to infiltrate through the wire to try to kill us. And we were told if you hear the wire you know, rattling uh, the cans, so forth, not to shoot our weapons. Why would we shoot our weapons at night? Go ahead. Yeah, so Excuse me? So it'll alert the enemy to where you are. Right. If you shot your weapon at night, when you shoot a weapon, the sparks come out of the barrel. At nighttime, it would light up. It would show to the enemy your position. We were told to throw grenades. This is a dud, guys. It's not a live grenade. All right? All right. Anybody know what this is? Everybody see one? Got a question? Um, no, I was going to try to answer. I can't hear you, son. Stand here. up, son. I was going to try to answer what type of grenade that is. And uh, MK2 hand grenade. That's, that's close good. enough. Yeah. We call it a pineapple. Yeah. Why do they call it a pineapple? It looks like a pineapple. It looks like a pineapple, right? Those look got round and so forth. Okay. Hey, you want to show them every day? I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> And, and hand grenade comes from a French word, hand bomb. The hand grenade sounds better than a hand bomb. Anyway, about 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, you could see your hand in front of you, and all of a sudden we heard the cans rattling. Now, you don't know if one Chinese is coming through or a hundred coming through. You don't know this is going to be your last night living. And you get nervous, you get scared. Actually, like I can say, you get scared, but you don't know what's happening. When you don't know what's happening, it, it, it's, you get nervous, you get scared, you want to be somewhere else. Anyway, to make a long story short, and we alerted the, the captain and, and the radio man, and we had a box of hand grenades, and uh, I think I threw one hand grenade in Camp Pendle on training. All I could do is pull the pin and get rid of it as fast as you can. And we must have threw about half a dozen or so or more grenades into the air where we heard the tin cans rattling, and everything got quiet. So we knew whoever was in that wire that we killed, that we couldn't wait for daylight to come to see what we did. Daylight came, we killed three pigs. Wow, now we got fresh pork. Great, we called the field kitchen up behind us. We told them we got three dead pigs, come pick them up and have fresh pork. But all of a sudden, the Korean farmer came and said that we killed his pigs and we wanted to get, we wanted to get paid for it. And the lieutenant said, okay, we'll pay for your pigs, no problem. Wrote him a, a note, whatever it was, and paid for the pigs. After we paid for the pigs, he came along and took the pigs away. And the Marine sergeant wanted to shoot him. Uh, some nanny guy. That was, that was not, not nice to pay for the pigs, and he took the pigs away. But the Marines found out where his farm was, and we got a couple of pigs back. And we did have some pork. And just one little incident that you know that you don't forget. It could be comical, it could be serious, whatever. Okay. Uh, 
when I left the service, I got an honorable discharge, I served my country, and your country thanks you by giving you a lot of benefits. One of the benefits I had, when you take a civil service test for a government job, you get 10 points automatically. And I took a test for a Philadelphia Police Department. I got an 85. That 10 points gave me 95. They only took 90 and above. So it wasn't for that 10 points, I wouldn't have gotten on the police department. I put 28 years in the police department, and I do everything all over again, and here I am. Any questions? Now, I got, you got a question. When did you join, when did you join the police I can't hear you. You don't have to be when, loud, louder, When sir. did you become a police officer? When did you become a police officer? Uh, in 1955, like a matter of service. Now, I'm a firm believer of first aid, but I was a corpsman. Uh, as an example, if your buddy gets a cut and he's bleeding, how would you stop the bleeding? Come on, how would you stop it? Pressure. Pressure point. Remember that, guys. Take a first aid course. If you never had one, buy a first aid book, read it. You don't have to be a doctor to save someone's life. The corpsman and the medics in Korea, if you don't get to a wound in the first 15 minutes, and if he's seriously wounded, he's going to die. So we weren't doctors, but we had the knowledge to save lives. So if you had no knowledge of first aid, get some knowledge and be surprised you might save somebody's life. Any questions? Ask some questions, guys. Yeah, go ahead. What was the crime like in Philadelphia when you were an officer? What was the crime like in Philadelphia? Not as bad as it is now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, well, in my day, they respected the police officer. They, they don't. Yeah, okay, you got more sleeping time, too, man. Yeah, you, know, you tell somebody to go up the corner, they got off. Today they say, make me, you know. It's a whole different world today. It's a shame. That's not good. Not good. Okay. Very good. Uh, who's going to go into service when they graduate? Anybody? Somebody? Okay. What are you going to go in? Navy. Navy, very good choice. Good choice. Army. Army. Good man. Good man. Hang in there, son. It'll be tough. What are you going to be in? The Navy. The Navy? Navy. The Navy? Good, you'll see the world. How about you? Army. Huh? Army. Army. Good. Right, no no army. army. Parents raise him right. <laughs> Any Marines? Anybody going to go to Marine Corps? They're not they crazy, that's they're not crazy. They don't, they don't want to be doormen. Yeah, the Marines get about twice as much training uh, as the Army for some reason or other. You know, they brainwash to get them guys. They say one Marine is worth three soldiers. They don't believe it. See what it is, you gotta give the Marines credit. They're always the first ones in the battle. But the Army has to follow up and make sure they get the job right. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, like I said, I was drafted three months shy of 18 years old in the United States Army. But never drafted, I would go right up the road to Fort Dix for basic training, but I did. And how I learned, got inducted into Army life was from Fort Dix, from Camden, New Jersey to Fort Dix, Took us 22 hours. We went around the world. And believe me, when we got off the bus, the drill sergeant says, "Welcome to Army life." But from there, I learned how to fire and maintain every small weapon the United States Army had: 50 caliber machine guns, 30 caliber machine guns, M1s, 45s. You name it, they had it. We learned how to use use it and maintain it. After my basic training, I went to Fort Knox in Kentucky. They made, I, they made me a tanker. I was there for 60 days. First two weeks we were in classes. Learned all the nomenclature on the tank, M48 Patton. From there we went out to the field. Now we're going over the course one day. Hatches closed. I was, they, every, you got to learn how I Every phase of that tank, in case, from the commander right on down to the driver. We're going over the course, and all of a sudden, we went to this mud pit. The commander knew we were going, and he, so we're stuck. He says, try to get it out, can't get it out. He says, now, it's your job as the driver to hook up them cables on the side of the turf. Now, on the bottom of the tank, they had place while it would eyes in them, but not that big. You got out, you put the cable on. And then he'd run a cable out and they call what they had what they call a tank retreat. Now, when I when I, I was there, I was just deep in mud and water. 
Now I gotta get them down the bottom of that tank. So I'm leaning over, I'm drinking muddy water. I got muddy water, mud and water all over me. Get everything hooked up, run the cables out, get back up on the tank, get ready to get back in. The commander says, please don't, soldier. I said, well, I'm getting back in the driver's seat, sir. He said, you ain't getting in my tank looking like that. And I'm saying to myself, now what do I do? Sit down the road about a quarter of a mile is a lake. You got five minutes to get down there and back. I never ran so fast in my life. <laughs> I run down there, man, I run into the water, I take my helmet off, I'm dumping water on me, I get all cleaned off, I run back, jump on the tank, start to get in. He says, what are you doing, soldier? I said, I'm getting, I'm all cleaned off, so I'm getting back to the tank. She ain't getting my tank wet. <laughs> now I'm saying, what am I supposed to do now? He said, stand back there by the exhaust and dry off until I feel you're drying off. I'm back there about four or five minutes. He said, all right, you can get back in now. All right, let me stop you there. That's called military discipline, by the way. <laughs> So we got pulled out. I, when I got out on the dry ground, I took the cables off, put them back on the turret. We get out the road a little further, and we're going up this incline. <clears throat> now here we are. We're, 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 mind you, we're driving with closed hatches. You had three parachutes, one on each side and one in front. Now I'm going up and up and up. Now I'm looking at the sky. I said, oh, I won't say what I actually said. But I said, oh, man, what am I going to do now? And I hit what they call the balance and that tank came down slammed. And what saved me from getting a concussion is two things. I have one of these on, and I'm a hard-headed pull on. That's what saved me from getting a concussion. So we, then we, after that, we went on down the road, and then we had, we had to fire the uh, 90 millimeter on how to fire and load that. We had 50 caliber training. And we're going to just punch the things into the GPS. You had to do it with a map like the captain did with his artillery. And then you fire a couple in, like the artillery, they say fire for effect at the target. After that training, I went to California for a couple months. I, I, we knew about Korea. And we figured, well, we're not going to roll with you. It was a 13 month tour, and we only had about 11 months left, 11 and a half months. Well, me and my buddy should have kept our mouth shut because three weeks later we got our order. Get over there, <coughs> and I was assigned to the 7th Infantry Division. When we get over there, we go into a big building where they assign you the units. They assigned me to the 17th Transportation Battalion up on the DMZ. I was assigned to Charlie Company, 17th Trans. Now, we did different training. We were always in a hot spot, which it still is today. We were put on a couple, what they call high red alert. And one of them, in the middle of the night, were down a motor pool where you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, it was so dark. And me and my buddy standing there, commanding general of the 7th Division, was coming through, checking everything. And um, we're from maybe here to where that young man's leaning on his back. So I said to him, after he said he wanted the motor pool police, I said, in a low voice, I said, what's this guy, nuts? What's he, what, the enemy is think we're not a bunch of slobs? He walked over and he said, what'd you say, soldier? I said, ready, all ready to go, sir. He said, I thought that's what you said. <laughs> now we, we got our assignments, and that time we went to Seoul. They were overthrowing St. Marie's cover. And we took troops down there. Took a little bit of fire going down, but it was no big thing. Any questions? <coughs> okay, now. Thank you, thank you, George. I'll get you next. Captain, you have five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. All right, I'm going to have to rush this real quick. <clears throat> you asked about entertainment. Okay. Now, you got to remember that we were 21 years old and horny as can be. <laughs> Over there, in the middle of nowhere, no women anywhere at all. It was just devastating to our young libido. Okay, now, eight, <clears throat> she's sitting back there laughing. Yeah, you know, 18 months. I've, it was 18 months since I had been in been home. And by the way, we had no cell phones, so we never, nobody would talk with anybody from back home. Everything had to be by letter. 
They said, look, you're going to have a USO show. They're going to come in and they're going to bring some young ladies from New York and Hollywood. And, well, right away we brightened up. I mean, this, this is wonderful. So we're sitting there, 5,000 of us on the side of a hill, a little stage set up. And the announcer said, we've got these nice young ladies. And about, I've forgotten now, but well, I think there were a dozen of these nice young ladies came from Broadway. And they danced for us. All I remember is short skirts and long legs. Ha! <laughs> oh, it was so <laughs> You'd have no idea when you're at, uh, you know, away from home for such a long time, especially when you haven't had the enjoyable, uh, how do I put it, uh, acquaintance of a young lady. Uh, and after that, there was a comedian. He was pretty funny, but we really weren't interested in him at all. And finally, <clears throat> he said, we've got a young lady we're going to come out on the stage for you. We think she's going to be one of the greatest stars that ever came out of Hollywood. What did we know? 18 months, we hadn't seen a movie. We, didn't, we had no idea who it was at all. And then he says, I'm not going to give you her name, but you take a good look at her, more or less. And out she came from the right-hand side. All I can remember is this beautiful shaped woman. <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous, except for my wife, of course. Right. Yeah. She came out in a white dress that was looked like it was painted on her. And they showed all of the great attributes that God gave her. <laughs> and she came out from the side and she wiggled and wiggled and wiggled across the whole board. We watched every wiggle. And she got, and she got to, the, to the microphone. And in a deep voice, breathy, she said, hello, boys. Dude, 5,000 men jumped up and down screaming. <laughs> Somebody hollered out, that's what we're fighting for. <laughs> and she was absolutely gorgeous. She sang two songs, I think. I was too busy looking at her. I don't remember what it was. And, she, and at the end, of course, what really set the, the rest of the people off the back of me was she said, thank you, boys, and bent over. Good God Almighty. <laughs> it was a riot. But I was, I was wondering why all those NPs, military police, were down in front. Now I know why. And she then turned and wiggled all the way across. Okay, and we watched it all the way across. <laughs> she got and she went on out. See, before she left, she said, I'd like to talk to some of the GIs. But I had the very good fortune of being down at the bottom with two other lieutenants, and the rest were listed. So the men were lined up this way. Now I'm down the end, Billy's alongside of me, and I'm watching this woman as she wiggled and wiggled up closer and closer and closer. That's when I realized, I noticed that she had great big blue eyes. It was amazing. I don't know if I could get. The sight of that woman was enough to drive you crazy. And then she came up closer and closer and closer. She stood in front of me, looking at me with those great big beautiful eyes. And she said, what's your name? I couldn't remember my name. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I got out of that real quick and I told her who I was. She said, do you have a girlfriend? I said, yes, I have a this lovely young redheaded woman waiting for me back home, and a few other things that we said. She said, we're very polite. And you could just feel the sensuality of this woman. She just radiated it. It was at that moment that I damn near fell in love with her. It was amazing. Wonderful, wonderful woman. She said, do you want to shake hands? So I put my hand out there and shook hands. I felt the electricity go all the way up my arm. All I know is that she was a wonderful woman. Yes. Sorry that she had wound up the way she did with the drugs. That's the lesson. She did all the way from drugs. Other than that, it was a wonderful time. Thank you all for your